Well, uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I'd like to begin by welcoming you all to Dublin Central, uh, and uh, looking forward to uh, spending some time with you all, and I think the sheer number of people that are here this evening is a testament to the uh, height of standing which Patrick commands, and the interest that you all have in the insights from his book, and his uh, career, and really uh, his role at the very cold face of our many, many challenges. And what I'm going to do in my own few words is uh, just offer some observations on the book that I think are quite relevant to many of the challenges that we face today, and indeed some of the challenges that I'm grappling with myself at the moment. Uh, because uh, one of the great values in this particular book and in this volume is that it very, very clearly goes through many of the perceptions and indeed myths that are there regarding what happened during the crisis period and takes the reader through the very informed views that Patrick has on the issue. He's already begun this approach. He began this approach in an article that it was a precursor to this book when he reminded the reader uh, that many of the budgetary corrections that happened at our darkest and most difficult time actually happened prior to the arrival of the Troika into Ireland. And what the book very, very successfully does is it goes through a number of the other claims that have been very contested and offers some differing and very and obviously deeply informed views in relation to them. Whether this be the concept that developed, that the difficulty that we grappled with was purely a banking crisis, whether it be the view that developed that many of the difficulties that we had were driven solely by what happened with the banks and the need to put in place very difficult budgetary measures was solely di driven by the great challenge that we had with our banking system at that time. And perhaps most pertinently for the volume overall, addressing the claim that membership of the euro uh, was the reason for our economic crash and our great economic difficulty. And one of the things that we are short of here in Ireland is we are short of policy makers, uh, whether they be uh, a former uh, central bankers, whether it be those who work in our civil and public service, and also politicians. We are short of them offering their views on what it was like to be uh, in positions of leadership, particularly in positions of leadership at times of great difficulty. I look to my colleague here, Rory Quinn. Uh, he's quite rare as politicians in offering insights in his time in office, in his time in politics, in his great autobiography. But the kind of policy insights that Patrick has to offer in his book is quite rare and that's what makes it so valuable. And it's one of the reasons why uh, I was uh, and decided to go ahead with commissioning a sequel to Ronan Fanning's History of the Department of Finance, because I felt it was very, very important that the work that Ronan Fanning did in offering a critical appraisal of the Department of Finance, that that was continued. And there is a process underway in relation to that which will lead to the commissioning of an author or group of authors that will take the history right up to 1999. So if I go back to this particular book, and I had the opportunity over the weekend to read most of us, though not all of us, and I'm looking forward to finding some time to finish it all off. What were the different insights that struck me uh, as I worked my way through the book? The first one is, is a constant theme in Patrick's work and a constant theme in this particular volume, that is that being a member of a single currency zone is not all about opportunity. Uh, when you're inside a single currency zone, you obviously uh, surrender particular budgetary, budgetary uh, well, economic policy instruments, particularly where you are with uh, exchange rate policy and monetary policy. This then means that greater responsibility is conferred on the use of budgetary policy. And one of the issues that Patrick explores in this book is the degree to which that perspective was missing in the run-up to the crisis period, where during that period it was assumed 
that we can make particular national budgetary decisions, make particular decisions in relation to the level of credits within our economy, but not be aware of the fact that uh, while we had a currency, obviously, we shared that currency with many, many other economies and countries. We focused on what the benefit was of sharing a single currency zone. We overlaid that with our membership of the single market. We didn't put enough focus on the fact that that conferred responsibility on us and didn't also give enough thought to the fact that this is an amplifier not only of benefit to a national economy, it can also be an amplifier of great risk. Uh, and the way this theme is explored in Patrick's book, I found particularly valuable because, of course, this is a debate that never ends. It's a debate that is ongoing. Uh, and as somebody who is immersed in lots of debates at the moment regarding budgetary policy and expenditure policy in particular, the kind of insight that Patrick develops in his book is very relevant to where we are now today. The second theme that was important to me was the other C of the volume, which is, of course, levels of credit. Uh, the book is a solitary reminder, as if we need one, but we always need to be reminded of it, of the supercharged levels of credit that were available in our economy across that period and the catastrophic effect that it subsequently had. It's worth being reminded of what those figures were. In January 2003, up to a peak of May 2008, household credit in our economy went from 57 billion euro to 156 billion euro. That was the rate of change. And as uh, the book also demonstrates, what was really, really vital was not only the quantity of that credit, but it was the composition of that credit, how it was made up. Uh, by the mid-2000s, two-thirds of the loans in our economy had a loan-to-income ratio that was greater than three and a half, and one-fifth of loans in our economy had a loan-to-value ratio that was greater than 95%. So it wasn't just the level of credit with our, in our economy, it was the composition of it, it was the makeup of it. And of course, we all know the subsequent vast difficulties that emerged from this, both when it became apparent that the level of funding wasn't actually in place to fund this level of credit, when it became apparent the degree to which domestic savings were utterly inadequate to deal with this level of credit, and our banks became more and more dependent on international capital markets to fund that credit with disastrous consequences for all of us. I contrast that with some of the debate that we have now. It is striking uh, that we are where we are at this point in our economic development and economic growth with a level of credit that is a fraction of that. In fact, if you look at the levels of credit in our economy over the last number of years, uh, in many different ways they've been flat, they haven't grown, and we are way below the level of credit that caused such vast harm to us. The next point that, again, I felt was relevant in this book is the work and the debate that Patrick raises regarding the European institutions that were in place across this period. I leave it to others that might speak, or others who read the book, to form a view regarding the role of the European institutions. I'm going to say that quite carefully because I'm still dealing with them myself at the moment. <laughs> Um, but what is striking in the book is the point that is made again and again is that the institutions, particularly across Europe, were uh, uh, only being put together or were underdeveloped for the scale of challenge that both the Eurozone and Ireland then had to confront. Uh, from an institutional point of view, that's particularly relevant to me. Uh, last Thursday night, um, uh, I was in Luxembourg for our monthly Eurogroup and Ecofund meeting. We spent, uh, as can sometimes be the case, up to half four on Friday morning engaged in trying to reach agreement regarding the role of the ESM, regarding the role of the ESM being a backstop to future state and banking difficulties, and then engaged in a debate regarding the role and power of the single supervisory mechanism. 
So Patrick's book is very clear in pointing out many of the issues regarding the institutional deficiencies and capacity gaps that were there. And while there is definitely a debate to be had regarding the operation of what we have in place now, what has changed is the scale of institutions and the power that they have. And I uh, sometimes make this point in debates on this issue that for those who think our regulation of the banking sector has not changed, they've never dealt with the single supervisory mechanism. It's a very clear example of the change that has happened. The final point that was again relevant to me and work that I'm involved in is the uh, point that Patrick makes in his book, not just about the deficiencies that were there in the design of the Eurozone, but also the deficiencies that we had in terms of our own institutions and their inability to be aware of the responsibilities that they had and their role within a single currency zone. If I go back to the first point regarding the incomplete design of the Eurozone, again, last week we spent a lot of time engaging and trying to see if we could reach agreement in relation to what the term sheet is going to be for what's now called the BIC. The BIC for those of you who mightn't be aware, it's what now has been referred to as the budgetary instrument for convergence and competitiveness, which is a debate that is underway regarding the new kind of tools the Eurozone may need to support countries who face a systemic shock and what can be done to deepen the tools that are there. The fact that that debate is ongoing and the fact that that work is not yet complete speaks to the fact that some of the lessons and issues that uh, Patrick identified are still really live issues. They're debates that are not yet concluded. And I can see at first hand the degree of tension at times and disagreement that exists, not only regarding the funding of those instruments, but also regarding their use. A similar point is made regarding our own national institutions regarding their failure across that period. If we contrast that with where we are now, we have a central bank through various legislative changes that has a significantly expanded policy armory open to us than it did during that period, much of which was instigated during Patrick's tenure as governor. The Oireachtas then made a number of changes and much of that work now is still ongoing. To give a concrete example of that, Tomorrow morning, I'm taking to Cabinet proposals in relation to how we can look at strengthening the accountability and the sanction regime available to individual key members of our banks. This is a deficiency that was uh, identified by so many, but the consequences of it and the harm that it imposed on our banks, again, is documented in many works, not only Patrick's, but this work is ongoing. We're still inv involved in much debate regarding changes that are needed. And this is exemplified by the kind of debate now that we're having in relation to the conclusion of the uh, mortgage tracker saga, all of the harm that that did, and the inquiry that is still underway in relation to us. A, various obvious, a very obvious example of the institutional change is now the role of the Irish Fiscal Advisory Council. The debate that I've been involved in and the scrutiny they're placing me under, that is not evidence of institutional weakness. That's evidence of institutional strength. The very reason an organisation like that was set up is to offer views regarding the performance of governments and the responsibilities that they have. And it's then up to the Minister of the Day, and obviously me, to form a view on that and to respond back. But this is the kind of change and the kind of contrasting debate and differing views that Patrick in his book makes the point is, was conspicuously absent. So in conclusion, I'm reminded of a comment and a famous comment that was made by Winston Churchill when he concluded in one of his works of history that history is written by the victors. In Patrick's book, he makes the point, I think, towards the end that the scars are still there, so much harm was done, and this is a history from which it's very, very hard to see any victors at all, particularly within our own country and our own economy. And a balance 
that I need to strike, and it's one that I'm constantly in the middle of, is how we can deal with the social scars, how we can deal with the pent-up need and demand that is still there, that citizens still feel, while trying to get the balance right between the needs of tomorrow. And this is the challenge of political economy. It's the challenge of being responsible for an economy that's located within a democracy. Trying to get that balance right between how you can maintain support for what you are doing in economy and getting the balance right between the needs of today and the imperative of tomorrow. And this is the challenge. Uh, having read much of Patrick's book and having considered some of the points that he made in the book, what I wanted to illustrate is two things. Fact number one, that many of the issues that he've identified, we have made progress on, but we still have more progress to make. And the second point is, is that the uh, level of uh, challenge that Patrick described in his book, the cost that is there, and the harm that it did, not only obviously to our economy, to our society, is something that we always have to remind ourselves of and always have to challenge ourselves to see are there different ways of managing and ways of avoiding this crisis happening again. I believe a really important part of how we have to do that is ensuring there is debate about policy alternatives, ensuring our public debate can be better informed. And one small example of how this is done in Patrick's book is when he goes through the different five currency regimes that Ireland has participated in and goes through the counterfactual example of would we have been better off outside of the euro. And for those of you who want to find the answer to that question, you're going to have to read the book. <laughs> Uh, so, on that note, I just want to not only congratulate uh, Patrick uh, for the book, uh, which is really relevant to many of the issues of today, very relevant to trying to understand where we were in recent years, and obviously, at a moment like this, congratulate him for the extraordinary contribution that he made to our country at a time of great difficulty. Thank you. Thank you very much, Minister, for um, such interesting, penetrating comments. I think we're very lucky to have such a thoughtful Minister for Finance. Uh, and it's great to, uh, that he's launched the book in, in such style uh, this evening. Um, thanks are in order, but then even the people in the room, there's so many people to, to thank. Um, certainly have to thank uh, Rory and, and Donal and indeed Jill and, uh, for hosting the event. Um, I was just the thinking... <laughs> I was just thinking, um, <laughs> talking to, to Donal and to Rory O'Donnell, who's, who's also there, that uh, it's, um, it's now 30 years ago since, uh, Donal, uh, since Rory and myself wrote the first book in, in this institute about the single currency, and, um, and look what happened. <laughs> so, um, no, but there are so many people. But, uh, my successor, Philip Lane, not only insisted that I write the book and kept on saying, how far is it along now, how, how are you doing? But he also made it possible uh, that I would have enough access to the documents that I needed because you can't take, you're not allowed to take. Uh, but, and that was important to get, make sure that the, the thing is properly documented. And of course, the archivists at, at the Central Bank. And then if I start with the Central Bank, there's such a list of people who have been vital over the last 10 years um, in, in one way or another. Uh, so it, it's just Im impossible to, to uh, 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 add all those things. Uh, Isolt is here. Um, sh she's also made it possible. And now that the book is finished, I have no further excuses <laughs> to, to be dodging the various um, things that she wants me to do. <laughs> um, and thinking, who, who else could you, you thank? And you think, or bankers. Oh, yes, because without the bankers, <laughs> there wouldn't have been any materials. <laughs> but but having, having said that, um, you know, bank, banker bashing is, is good fun, and I, I noticed that the, um, 
that the Irish Times uh, uh, journalists picked out that part of the book to, to um, highlight it last mm -hmm. Saturday, Saturday week. Um, but actually, it's, it, it is something that we have to be careful about is, is the role of, of our institutions, the institutions of state and the, ins the national institutions generally. Uh, first, first of all, of course, they, they should function for the people. But if they're seen and if we make cheap shots at everything, yeah, all the institutions of state, uh, then the, the trust and the confidence of the general public can be eroded very badly. And we've seen that in other countries, and there's always a threat of that here. And of course, that means that the institutions must serve the public. And um, the, so let me, let me come back to that in terms of the central bank. I want to make four points that are not like the themes of the book, but because everybody in the room knows the story and I hope you'll find some details that you, you don't know in the book. Um, but just four themes that I thought, these might be angles of, of perspective that uh, you might find interesting. First of all, the market is always wrong. On average, it's right, but it's nearly always wrong. Um, and we saw that in many ways. We saw how wrong it was in the years before the crisis, up to 2007. Uh, it was wrong because it was over-optimistic and thought well, Ireland, nothing, nothing can go wrong in Ireland. And then after that, and progressively 8, 2008, 9, 10, it became too pessimistic. And it overshot in its pessimism, actually, as, as, as subsequent uh, events showed. And then maybe by about 2013, maybe it had, had it about right. And then with, in some quarters, with the 2015, the 20-something percent GDP growth, Marcus started to get over-optimistic about Ireland again. Now, where are we now today? No, I'm retired. I don't know. But we've got to be careful, <laughs> careful assuming that the market has these macroeconomic things right. And that is the reason why we have to have a, a macroeconomic uh, and financial, monetary and financial stability authority. Of course, the public sector can also get it wrong. And actually, within that time frame that I was talking about, in 2010, and this is, you'll see this in, in, in the book. In 2010, when Greece was in terrible trouble, uh, the European official s sector was pointing to Ireland. Look, Greece. Look, Portugal. Look at Ireland. Ireland is doing everything right. Well, we were trying to do everything right, but we were very far from, uh, from having achieved that. And that was a mistake that uh, allowed them to be shocked when things didn't work out. So it's very, very, there are very complex um, issues that do require institutions to think carefully about, uh, about these, these things. So, we, so that's why we have a central bank. And what I want to say about the central bank and its mandate is, there's been a fashion over the last 25 years that central banks should stick to very narrow mandate of keeping, getting price stability 2%, on average, good rate of inflation. Not zero for various technical reasons. 2% is good. That's all. Let central banks not do anything else. And I think that the crisis showed quite clearly that that's not good enough, that the central bank must hold. There is an implicit mandate for the central bank to pick up other tools and work to stabilize the economy when it goes badly off the rails. And, and that was not learned very quickly in cer certain quarters. Uh, in, in, in Europe in particular, um, and central banks tend to say, with somebody else's problem. And I think it was one of the things that we, we insisted on the central bank, we think we have a mandate to do this, we are going to do it. Not only that, but when people ask us, will you do this as well and do this as well, there were risks in taking on additional responsibilities, but we thought, if we don't do it, who will do it? And that also speaks, and this is my, my, um, my third point, to the role of the central bank in one country in Europe in relation to the rest of Europe. Um, you know, a, a, friend, a friend in need is a friend indeed, and, and who, who were the friends? Well, this was quite complicated, but one thing was clear to me all along is that the treaty says that the central, each central bank will be represented with its governor in the governing council. And that means that vital national interests have to be presented by the National Central Bank in Europe 
and fought for. And you don't lose your nationality when you go to the ECB to, do, to, to um, uh, perform these functions. There are, you, there you have responsibility to the mandate of the ECB and the euro system as a whole, but you also have a, an important national responsibility. How did our European colleagues do? There was a lot of discussion of that in, in the book. Europe and the IMF, European authorities didn't do as well at first as the IMF did because the IMF were used to these situations. They were used to countries that got, got into difficulty and they didn't, they could stand back and compare and contrast other experiences. Europe did not have that experience at first and made some bad mistakes, mistakes that cost other countries in Europe as well as the stressed countries like, like Ireland. In the end, and I discussed this in, at length in the book, in the end, they made redress. You can decide whether they made adequate redress or not, but quite substantial redress was made in some of the arrangements that sorted eventually the banking uh, indebtedness that had arisen with the ECB. They didn't want to boast about it, but you can detect that they felt bad about how they had handled it earlier on. Actually, going to Dan O'Brien was asking me, well, what's the numbers? Give us some numbers. And, and, there, and, and it's there. You'll, you'll find a, a detailed <laughs> set of footnotes ab about all, all, all that by, by the book. I just want to say one last thing, and I think it's important, because I think we've got to, when, when we think of austerity and the fiscal contraction and the cutbacks and all the pain that uh, passed through the contraction of the, this state's apparatus and, and the increase in, in taxation. I think we've got to contrast ideology and necessity as drivers of this kind of behavior. And this is true in the 1980s as well as, as, as in the last um, uh, 10 years. I mean, when, when the government of Garrett Fitzgerald that I was uh, working with in the 1980s, when they cut, made cutbacks, and when they increased tax rates, they hated doing it. They hated every minute of it. The Thatcher regime in Britain didn't really have the same attitude. They thought this is, you know, everything has gone out of whack. We don't want big government. And in a way, we have the same parallel in, in this more recent experience. Um, you know, we had successive ministers of finance, Lenehan, uh, Noonan, Howlin. They also hated cutting back. They, it was necessary, but they hated doing it. Whereas Osborne, he said, okay, now I think we've got everything in balance, but we can cut things even more. And we think it's a better uh, approach, an ideological approach to, to austerity. So and I think we need to hold on to that. Our government policies in this country have not been ideologically driven. They have been pragmatically driven. Sometimes they go off, off uh, 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 into unsustainable territory, and they've got to be yanked back. Those were the, the, um, the, the thoughts I, I uh, had, and then um, you're meant to thank even more people at the end, but I, um, I'm not going to do that. Thank you very much. <laughs>